we're digging into chapter 28. All right. Okay. And the higher one is lifted. And I was just rereading the chapter. And you you mention a lot, you talk a lot about prayer in this chapter, John. Yes. I thought before we go over some of the things I highlighted, maybe you could talk a little bit about what prayer means to you if you had to put it into words. I mean, up just this afternoon, I, I was at a sort of social gathering and um, and uh, as a as a gift to my host I took one of my books I took Mystic Approaches and on the back cover of Mystic Approaches I wrote um, the question how can I best serve the world I know I was, I was a farmer then, and of course what I was thinking of mostly, I suppose, was, was the farm, the farming world. I don't know, perhaps not. Perhaps I was really stretching out to include the whole world. But anyway, it doesn't matter. How can I best serve the world I love? And then uh, the answer led me, led him ever more, ever deeper into prayer. So if you ask me, what does prayer mean to me? Perhaps it's the best thing I can do to serve the world, to serve the needs of the world. Yes, that answers it quite well. Now I wrote that, I must have been still probably in my 40s, that was 40 years ago. And of course I've learnt a lot since then still learning. The prayer evolves. You see, if you ask me how does it evolve, that's more difficult to say. You know, it's always when I'm faced with an, with an impossible question, my eyes go up from the computer, I look over the top of the computer, out of the window, at uh, the horizon, the woods, the hillside, and it uh, dissolves into the sky. I just want to look out there for help. <laughs> um, I think just the, that is the answer. If I don't know what to say, I look out the window. And somehow in that infinite, infinite, infinite what? Infinite, infinite forever of the, of the, of the sky, where whatever's, up, whatever's up there, at least it's not human words. Um, I find comfort, I find the answer, surprisingly. So perhaps the, what I mean by prayers has melt and dissolved ever more into the infinite unknown. Perhaps I don't really know what prayer is these days. I surrender it to the infinite unknown, beyond knowing, at least beyond me, John Butler being in control at all. In fact, John Butler, I think, just left, is left behind somewhere forgotten. Prayer perhaps becomes that infinite. What is it? The infinite. There are, sort of, there are half a dozen words we use that are associated with the infinite. The infinite peace, the infinite freedom, the infinite um, peace, freedom, love. That's what prayer is, just dissolving into the infinite freedom, peace, and love. What about that prevention? So, John, for those of us that are, I would say, beginners <laughs> or a, a practical application and I've heard you say this that meditation and prayer to you is the same thing yes, yes, yes. so if someone wanted to start praying or meditating yes 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 thank you yes that's a good thing to ask yes um well there's one very obvious uh, um, 
difference needs to begin with because prayer normally starts off with uh, with uh, an appeal of, of, of me, the separate individual, with various concerns in my mind, appealing to a, a, an entity we call God. So we, we made a list, list of names, somebody said, with friends and, and, and relatives are ill or dying or something. And so you say, God, please help, her, help Auntie Mary. If this is normally done verbally and to, uh, and to God as a separate entity, well, think of any close relationship. Run out of words or find the needless words. Um, doesn't happen to everybody. Some use words up to the end of their lives. Some, some don't. Uh, it, it varies on the individual. Um, eventually, our uh, prayer may, as as, as, as happened to me, uh, I really can't tell the difference between prayer and meditation now. But that's in my experience. How it, uh, how it uh, appears to me, and I wouldn't wish to impose that on anybody else. Because. Uh, Consider the question for themselves in their own experience. Um, whereas, in contrast, when we start to meditate, it's good. Although many people use words, and uh, some people think that is meditation, using words, just repeating words in the mind, and thinking about words, well, that's one way, but also meditation, also like prayer, it will deepen with practice and over more or less a uh, number of years, but also reach this point of total silence. And to surrender, melting, as it were, into, into this, into this, uh, into this, whatever we call God. Um, less me, more God. But, uh, I really don't think I can be dogmatic and say it's this or that because it's, it's entirely a matter of the individual's experience and how it appears to them. You know, how you can't say what beauty is, can you? How can I define beauty? If we all look at different things and find beauty in different things in different ways, we love. You talk a lot about prayer and you start out with the mind needs the discipline of turning to God. Yes. And then you write, there's no alternative. Without it, the world waits to swallow us. Prayer is not, isn't always easy, oh no. Days, weeks can pass when practice, practice seems dry and unproductive. That mm. really struck a chord with me. So my, my question, John, is, for someone that's new to prayer or meditation, like how would they start and how, how does it evolve? Well, I suppose for most people these days, it starts from either reading a book or probably even more likely finding something on the internet. Some people pick up prayers at church. There are things called prayer books. We list kinds of verbal formulations that you can use so many many ways my dear in which people can be introduced to the subject but you know perhaps listeners won't be too surprised to know that i love to think of the first man who ever climbed a mountain you know and looked out on a broad view just imagine primitive man Whatever it was, climbing up to a mountain and just looking out. The world opening up before his eye. I don't know what he did. I think he thought, whatever way he had of expressing it, how wonderful. Oh God, how wonderful the world are. Do you think that's a wonderful natural prayer? Early man must have done a lot of just looking, looking up at the sky. I have myself lucky. I think really one of the great blessings of being a farmer is that my back was always hurting because most of 
My work was done with a bent back, working in the fields on my own. So I'd have to straighten up from time to time, wouldn't I? So what did I do when I straightened up? I looked at the horizon. So I'm used to doing that. I think that's probably one of the greatest blessings of being a farmer, dear, is that either by pain or some other reason, <laughs> you spend half your day looking at the horizon. What a wonderful thing to do. What's that if not natural prayer? Really, not only for pay from the pain of backache, but from the pain of most, most other sort of the mental luggage that I usually carry around in my mind. I love that, ver that verse from the Bible. Um, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Amen. I, swear. I tell you, I look out of the window, lifting up my eyes unto the hills, and immediately I feel helped. I've got access to this, not this silly old John Butler, but something much bigger outside the window. So you were asking, how does prayer start? In a countless ways, with every person is different. Surely it is. There's no formula. Or if there was, I wouldn't recommend it. What do you love, my dears? There's a good question. I'll answer one question with another. What do you love most? Now then, think of that. Whether it's a girl or freedom or, or some uh, one of the sweeties you want. Think of that. That's that's really a prayer, isn't it? Going into something bigger and better than yourself. What you really, really, really want to buy, what really means something to you. You know, not the latest silly ads on the internet, but what are your heart really reaching for? Something even beyond some specific person, some specific uh, you know, material aim in life. It doesn't need everybody have a, a, a sense of your own inner starlight. I wonder if that must be one of the most popular and widely known songs in the world. Countless people have responded to that, not only me. They also must have felt an echo, something in themselves. Don't fence me in. If we land lots of land in the starry sky above, don't fence me in. Something, something over the land I love, don't fence me in. Marvelous expression, isn't it? Didn't you have a poster in your room with? But it wasn't a poster. What was it? I can't remember. It was a picture. I was uh, in my study at school when I was I must have been in my early teens, yes, when that came into my mind. It was a long time ago, and I've loved it all my life. <laughs> a great song. I love it. You, you write about most practice of prayer on page 243. Most practice of prayer is patient plod. Yes. And I add the habit of early rising. <laughs> yes, once you get over the honeymoon period, <laughs> which I've really been talking about, because it's difficult to keep that, that, that fire of love burning in your heart all the time. It tends to flare up and die down a bit, doesn't it? Well, once you've gone past that stage and uh, realised that, that, that you've got to keep going, then it settles down to a patient plod. Um, 
you know, keep doing it, my dears, even though it's even though it's lost its shine. Um, perseverance. I do remember very well being told as a young man um, by the first uh, when I, I first learned to meditate and that the, the the main difference between a saint and uh, a more ordinary man is determination. So um, I recommend that to whoever's listening to this determination, my dears. Keep going, keep plodding on, even though the way seems uphill and you're not getting anywhere. Keep going. You'd be surprised. The view opens up unexpectedly. You write that the main impediments are thought, dream, self, will, self, made mental luggage of impure ego mind. And then you even say, what can, what can one do? So my question is, um, once the honeymoon phase of prayer meditation is over, do you have any advice of how to stick with it? Um, you just stick with it. Just stick with it. Yes, just that. <laughs> Determination. Set the intention and stick with it. Right. Yeah. I love how you wrote, um, God helps those who help themselves. Amen. It's an old saying, isn't it? It's the test of time. Another thing you touch on a lot in this chapter is your own experience of losing interest in the world. I think you wrote this during a big um, tidal wave disaster, it sounds like. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And um, I think we all experience being pulled into the world and you know there's always you just have to turn on the television and then there's drama to be found yes 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 this was uh, this was a notable it was a great tsunami that happened at this time when i think it was a who knows how many perished there were 150 000 people all around the indian ocean got to uh, got swept away um it's at this time I was beginning to um, to see the impact of, as I started talking about the sky, let me go back to that because it's really very helpful, I, I find. I call this chapter, The Higher One is Lifted. Now, think of what it's like when we go up in an aeroplane. The higher you go, the world, Seems very different, doesn't it? You can look down and see the world. And the dramas, the individual dramas of this world, you hardly see them, do you? It's rather like that when you when you when you're taken up into higher consciousness. The world at first then first becomes less compelling, you're less identified with it. You begin to see it as a, as a sort of pattern, changing and changing pattern. The individual dramas are somehow contained in this greater peace that contains it all. The sense that um, that no one really dies at all, because this higher consciousness is not only mine. It's, it's everybody's the reality of everything. Um, whether people realize it or not. Which most people don't. It doesn't matter too much. 
maybe this is exactly what prayer is. The prayer is the realization of this higher consciousness, which whether people recognize it or not, to some degree must permeate to everywhere, the whole world. Must be influenced by it. And is this so? Uh, it became ever more obvious to me. I suppose this gave me ever more confidence to surrender ever more and more into, into the arms of this infinite benevolence that is God. And to ever more total trust that this is the best thing one can possibly do. Everybody and everything is for every bird picking a poor worm to death. Not only the human drama, every grass being chewed up by a hungry animal. Why should the grass be chewed up? <laughs> Nature red in tooth and claw. Nature's wonderful, but it's, it's a pretty bloody business, isn't it? Mm. One's whole perception and understanding of what prayer is what the world is, what freedom is, and changes. Not just because you're in an airplane, but because inwardly, you see, meditation and prayer has become a sort of inward spiritual airplane, which has lifted your perception to a higher point of view, literally a higher point of view, just like when you, you climb a hill, the higher you go and look down on the, on the town in the valley, the perception changes, doesn't it? To feel the benefits, well, then you have to just to experience it. Stuff that's good by telling you. If you go up the hill, you feel better. You won't believe me. And if you go up there yourself, you, you experience it for yourself. You know, it's, it's true. John, on page 246 on the bottom, the last paragraph, and then the first paragraph on page 247, I thought maybe you could read that for us because it it talks about experiencing imperfection and and of what you were just talking about. Whenever we experience imperfection, misfortune, dissatisfaction, we are ourselves at fault, for we are seeing the wrong way round. It is a summons to return immediately to God, from where we will see rightly and stop feeding the false belief. Looking from above, that is from spirit, the situation is always all right. Because whatever takes place at ground level, the spiritual person, the essence is seen to remain intact. Without divisive personal interpretation, the apparently scattered fragments of life remain parts of the whole. Nothing is lost or destroyed or changed to re-emerge. All that happens is seen with it and as the will of one or God. And that actually answers what has happened in the 30 odd years since I wrote that. See, 30 years ago, I was discovering, I was first realizing it, and I was recording it because it was something that was fairly new to me. I suppose since then, it's a matter of practice what I preach. I'm putting it to practice, so that now, more or less, I won't say all the time, has become my daily reality. That's what my early realization has matured, actually become what I just described in my better days. I'm so glad you read that for us. I hope someday you will 
do a full recording of this book. That'd be really wonderful. I um the next paragraph I like triple highlighted it. <laughs> <laughs> it really hit me hard today where you write, I find myself ever less interested in the outwardly seen and heard when pulled too much into them. I feel wrong. Yes. That really hit me personally very hard. So my question, John, is when you feel pulled into the world, because obviously we're, we're living in the world, and you feel it you feel that it's wrong like for me it generally shows up not to make this about me but as an example as a negative emotion call it getting angry or anxious or impatient what do you do in that moment <laughs> you feel, guy. <laughs> feel angry or impatient yeah, just like you what else can you do? <laughs> you suffer. <laughs> um, but you see, the very fact that it makes you uncomfortable is a little lesson, isn't it? It's a little sort of, you know, a little nudge, or sometimes a big nudge, to uh, what can we do? Turn to God, you see, turn to your practice. God help me. This is prayer. This is exactly why we have to, why we, you know, this is how we are led further and further into, into this work of uh, turning from, from what's wrong towards what's, I won't use the word wrong and right because this is going to get you towards the confusion of duality, but, but turning from, uh, turning from what makes you feel uncomfortable to what makes you feel better. If it makes you and me feel better, might that not sort of ripple out into the world a bit? Maybe it makes other people feel better too. Who knows? Who knows? What a lot goes on behind the scenes that we don't really know about. Most things in the world, if we were kind of led to believe material things of wants and needs are going to make us feel better, that is not my experience. No, neither mine. I think of poor people who think it is, they've got a big thing to let go of sooner or later because they can't take it with them. They may hang on to it till their deathbed, and then, of course, they're unhappy because they're leaving it behind. You've been saved that one if that realization has come to you early. And you'll pick up some other burdens on the way. On page 249, you talk about this. You talk about, or you write, all human thought and talk is actually a series of barriers. And then you go on to saying similar with human doing. So it's, you can't just turn thinking off. If you're in the world, you can't necessarily stop doing. Oh, you see. There's a very interesting, uh, another one of my favorite sayings in the Bible, one of the sayings of Jesus. Um, Without me, that is Jesus, you can do nothing. Now, again, I'm speaking as an old, old man to you now. And where I've I completely lost my trust in human answers, human efforts to get things right. You see, what do we mean by Jesus in this context? Well, what does he say? I am with you always. So what is it that is always with us, wherever we are? The person of God, the person of Jesus, the I am. 
without this, you can't do anything. You just get in a mess. Because you're operating like a like a car with only half its cylinders functioning or something. You know, a car without any petrol in the tank, it doesn't work very well. You link into this presence. And you'll find things will happen. Not according to your idea, you can just happen. You know, the, the, there's a breeze tonight, but the leaves are still blowing on the trees. I haven't asked them to do it. The, the, the leaves are just swaying this way and that in the breeze, aren't they? A little hummingbird hanging on a string. Huh? It's not a real one, it's a one that was sent to me, a little model one hanging on a string outside my window. It's just waving to and fro in the wind. Well, I didn't tell it to do that. It's just happening, isn't it, according to natural, natural rule. There you are, you see. Natural rule, my dears. That's what makes things happen naturally, isn't it? One of the last days of summer now, quite autumnal, chilly, damp. Summer's coming to an end. Happens naturally, doesn't it? You write about this, you, you say, I am not that body, nor bound in any way. And if that is true for me, it's true for all. And you go, you, you start talking about spirit, really on page you know, 248. I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that for those of us that have not experienced that, but obviously have heard it. Well, written down what I've experienced here. And um, you can take it or leave it as, as you like, but um, if it gives you any encouragement, well, be encouraged. But um, maybe it will encourage you to keep on with your own practice. Maybe one day you'll experience it for yourself. You'll say, oh, that old man knew what he was talking about. It's a very good word realization it's a way of realization what does that mean it means making something real so much of our life is based on theory it's only you read you haven't actually realized it yourself it was a long time for people to be persuaded that the world is round well, maybe it isn't. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's round. I've never seen it round. It looks rather flat to me. If they were wrong, right or wrong. You know, <laughs> sorry, silly example, maybe, but <laughs> you know, I used to think the moon was a piece of cheese. It was a long time with that little nursery rhyme. It was a somebody, somebody lived in the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I was had rockets and things up there. Oh well, a lot of funny little things like that. You realize we can be given these words like God. What does it mean when we first hear it? The big thing, God seems ever more real to me now. The world seems ever less real, really. World. Extraordinary how the world and all its problems is just dying out of me. I can hardly remember it now, like I can't remember most of my life. Just water under the bridge, you see. Where's it gone? This world, is it as real as we think it is? I tell you, when you get to my age, you look back, you're not so sure. And that's what lies ahead becomes ever more real. Funny, isn't it? What is it? Well, I don't know. But funny enough, not knowing seems much more sure to me now than all my the old certainties, but all the knowledge that is almost forgotten about now. Life's a funny business, isn't it? <laughs> Who can understand this? <laughs>